I'd like to introduce Anil Seth to everyone now. So he's a leading British researcher in the field of consciousness science. He's a professor of cognitive and computational neuroscience at the University of Sussex, the co-director co of the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research Program in Brain, Mind and Consciousness, and a European Research Council advanced investigator. He's published over 160 academic papers and he's recognized as a highly cited researcher, placing him in the top 1% of all researchers by field. Um, his writing has appeared in the New Scientist, Scientific American, The Guardian, and um, it looks like his TED talk on consciousness has been viewed a lot more than mine. <laughs> Man. Sorry about that. <laughs> like 11 million times. That's, that's probably 12 like million that. now. <laughs> <laughs> and they made me memorize the darn thing too. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and Neil, we're really excited to have you here. And um, everybody, this book is really interesting. It's just like I was telling Anil, um before we got started. It's just a lovely read. And, you know, you really, you really deserve all the good reviews it's been getting. So, well, okay. Oh, well, th thank you so much, Susan, for the for the kind introduction. Um, I echo all those nice things you said about my book, of course, for your for your book, Artificial You, which I very much enjoyed reading when it came out. Now, a couple of years ago, right? I think it was. It's been around for a little while, um, but I learned a lot from it, and I th thought it was a fantastic uh, treatment of the possible future of AI. And of course, it's Artificial You and Being You. I think we have quite symmetric titles there in our in That's our right. books. Um, <laughs> thank you for your kind words. But, I guess I better get the next one out. It's uh, nice to see a room. I can see people in the room as well. And I know there are other people uh, from all over the place, including my friend Neil from LA. Hello, Neil. Uh, so I'm just going to get started. And I have about half an hour brief run through some of the themes in the book. Of course, there's more in the book than will be in the talk. And then I believe we'll just have some chance for some open discussion, which I'm, I I want to make sure we have enough time for because that's always... Uh, the fun part. So with that, let me do the Zoom screen sharing dance, the next part of the dance that we all have to do for these things. And now it's just, just hold your horses. And now you should just be able to see a black screen. If that's what you see, then, then we're good. Is that right, Susan? Black screen? Yeah, okay, we're good, right. Okay, so I want to begin with a very simple question. And the simple question is, who am I? Susan has, of course, just introduced me, but I, I mean, who am I? Am I the same person that I was back in the before times, before we were all atomized into our spare rooms? Um, in a sense, I can't be. I mean, it feels like I am, but this last 18 months has been so strange. It's been such a radical disruption of the flow of events and social interactions that it seems that I must have changed too. Now, this picture that I that's before you now, that actually isn't my office, but I'm inviting you to look around it all the same uh, while I talk. And it does seem that there is a strong continuity, despite the events of the last couple of years, between myself then and myself now. And that continuity is a large part of what being anyone is all about. Now, while I was talking, that image was was changing. And um, I wonder if anybody saw, it's very hard to see, I can just about see the image of people in the background there. Uh, if anybody noticed what was, what was changing in that image. Um, it's a classic demonstration of what we call change blindness. Uh, let me show you for a second. I actually, it's not my own demonstration. I borrowed it from Mike Cohen. And can I just advance it now? So that's how it began. And that's how it finished. I find I always find it quite remarkable. So basically, almost everything on this image is changing. The roof is changing. The mats on the floor are changing. Uh, the bookcase is changing in all sorts of ways. Everything changes. And people usually use uh, examples like this to make the point that change of perception is not the same thing as perception of change. The fact that something is changing and our perceptions are changing doesn't always mean that we perceive the change. And when things change slowly and we're not paying attention to them, then we may not perceive the change at all. Now, I bring this up today because I think the same phenomenon applies 
to the experience of being a self, to the experience of being you or being me or being any self. In fact, it applies even more so. And I call this self-change blindness. And I make the case, I'd like to make the case anyway, that our brains and minds are geared by evolutionary design to perceive ourselves as changing less than we actually do. And the reason for this is that we perceive ourselves in order to control ourselves, in order to regulate our body's interior. The experience of being me or being you is a controlled hallucination that is designed by evolution to keep the body alive. And this is the core claim of, of the book and of my last few years of thinking about these sorts of things, which is that we perceive the world around us and ourselves within it, with, through, and because of our living bodies. This is the point I'd like to reach at the end of this talk, and maybe we can discuss it afterwards, because especially for an audience who, uh, through um, knowing through Susan's work, is very interested in AI and the possibility of artificial consciousness and artificial selves, we have an interesting set of questions here about the extent to which consciousness and selfhood depends on our nature's living systems on the one hand, or on its ability to recreate or replicate uh, human level intelligence uh, on the other hand. There's an interesting discussion to be had there. But before we get there and making this claim, which is the central theme of the book, the issue on the table and is the issue of consciousness the challenge of understanding consciousness, of understanding this relationship between a physical material system, such as a brain and a body, and the private, intrinsically subjective, big and beautiful world of conscious experience, and in particular, of the experience of being a self within this larger conscious scene that we always inhabit. And as always, when talking about controversial and difficult things, it's always best to begin with a definition. And my favorite working definition for consciousness comes from the philosopher Thomas Nagel, who said a mental, sorry, he said an organism has conscious mental states if and only if there is something it is like to be that organism. This is a sort of more formal way of saying that consciousness is simply a matter of any kind of subjective experience whatsoever. There is something it's like to be me, something it's like to be you, something it's like to be a bat, something it's like to be an elephant, but probably nothing it's like to be a table or a chair or an iPhone or a MacBook, at least as they exist right now. Uh, consciousness on this basic definition is not the same as intelligence. It's not the same as explicit selfhood, the knowledge that I'm a person with a set of memories and so on. Um, it is just the presence of raw experience. So that's a starting point. And the challenge of answering how consciousness arises, how it's part of the physical universe, has probably been best or certainly most uh, famously articulated uh, in modern days by the philosopher David Chalmers in the form of what he called the hard problem of consciousness. Now, I think probably many of you are already familiar uh, with this, but let me just put it on the table so we can uh, remind ourselves exactly what he said. It is widely agreed that experience arises from a physical basis, but we have no good explanation of why and how it so arises. Why should physical processing give rise to a rich inner life at all? It seems objectively unreasonable that it should, and yet it does. Chalmers distinguishes the hard problem from the so-called easy problems of neuroscience. And these are not easy in the sense of being easy to solve, but conceptually easy in the sense that there's no evident mystery that a mechanism could be up to the job. The easy problems in neuroscience are all those problems about how brains and bodies work, for which you can not really worry about consciousness. They're just stories about function, mechanism, behavior, and so on. Uh, and the intuition driving the hard problem is that if you solve all these easy problems at some point in the future, the hard problem would be untouched and pristine. Now, faced with a apparent mystery like this, people sometimes reach for quite radical alternatives. One such radical alternative that's got quite a lot of at least media play right now, and, and within philosophy too, it's getting some renewed attention, is panpsychism. This is the notion that consciousness is fundamental and ubiquitous, uh, that it's in everything and everywhere somehow. Now, there are sophisticated versions of panpsychism, and I quite like Philip Goff's uh, articulation, which doesn't say that 
a pair of socks is conscious, but the consciousness is nonetheless inherent in, in nature in the same way that mass energy is inherent in nature. Now, the problem for me with, with panpsychism is not so much that it seems crazy, it's just that it explains nothing, cannot be tested, and doesn't lead to any testable predictions, which is, makes it for me pretty much a non-starter. Uh, there's been a e recent exchange of discussions in the Journal of Consciousness Studies uh, responses to Philip Goff's book, and I wrote one of, one of them called The Real Problems with Panpsychism, which um, I invite you to have a look at if, you, if you'd like to. Now, on the other hand, you can go for what might be called a strongly illusionist perspective, which is to say we avoid the mystery of consciousness by saying that, well, consciousness doesn't really exist, or at least not how we normally think of it. Uh, now, I think of illusionism as a sort of powerful medicine. You have to take just the right amount take a little bit and you open up this useful gap between how things seem to us in our conscious experience and how things are. Uh, but take too much and you end up claiming that consciousness doesn't exist, which is for me not uh, a useful place to end up. For me, we start with consciousness. Consciousness is in fact the only thing that we can be sure of. It's, it's like that I'm a realist about the existence of conscious experiences. So I don't find myself drawn to these extremes. Rather, I'm drawn to a, what I would say is a more pragmatic approach to consciousness, which I've come to call building on the approaches of many others, like Francisco Varela's neurophenomenology, um, the real problem of consciousness. Now, the real problem of consciousness is put very simply like this. How can mechanisms and processes in the brain and the body explain, predict, and control properties of consciousness, both functional, like what can we do in virtue of being conscious, behave flexibly, and so on, but critically phenomenological. What are the properties of consciousness like at the level of experience? What's, why is a visual experience the way it is and different from an emotional experience, an experience of free will, and so on? Uh, and so this is neither the hard problem, because it's not trying to explain how consciousness is magicked out of mere mechanism somehow, but it's not the easy problems either, because it's not sweeping the subjective aspects of consciousness away under the carpet. Uh, it does, as I mentioned, inherit from lots of other parallel uh, missions like neurophenomenology and, and, and so on. Um, but I've just phrased it this way in terms of explanation, prediction, and control as being, for me, a, a clear and helpful way to think of it, because these are the criteria that we typically apply in science. If you can come up with, ex with, with uh, accounts, theories, backed by evidence that explain, predict, and control, then basically you've usually done the job that a scientific account of a phenomenon can do. And the optimism, the hope is, at least on my part, that instead of this doesn't sideline a hard problem entirely, but instead of trying to solve it directly, we will end up dissolving the hard problem, dissolving, not solving it. Will it succeed and will the apparent mystery completely evaporate in a puff of metaphysical smoke? Well, it's too, you can't really say at this point. My hope is that it will, but I don't want to put you know, the cart before the horse, so to speak. It's a question of getting on with this job and seeing what the hard problem looks like at the end of this long road of trying to explain, predict, and control all these properties. Okay, so that's the perspective overall that, that I like to take on consciousness science. But what are, oh, and I should also say that there is a, a useful analogy here that shouldn't be overextended. It, it, it can, we can discuss later the extent to which it's valid, which is how life was once uh, thought about. And it wasn't that long ago that people also thought that um, life could never be understood in terms of physics and chemistry, that there had to be something extra, some elan vital, some spike of spark of life that explained a difference between the living and the non-living. But of course, as people got on with the job of explaining the properties of living systems, things like uh, reproduction and metabolism, homeostasis, in terms of physics and chemistry, the hard problem of life wasn't solved, it, it dissolved. We don't understand everything about life, but this sense that there's some big mystery beyond the reach of science as we know it is no longer there. Now, life is not the same thing as consciousness. There's a key difference, which is you can't put a conscious experience on the table and look at it in the same way you can put a living system on a table and look at it. Uh, consciousness is intrinsically private and subjective. But that's primarily an epistemological limitation. It's a problem of how we get the relevant data. I don't think it undermines the 
the validity of this approach in general. But anyway, I don't want to get too far into the philosophy of science weeds here and just roll back and say, okay, well, what are these properties of consciousness that we might then explain? And we can cut this cake in various ways, but I like to cut it as follows, that we can think of consciousness along three interrelated dimensions. Very roughly, conscious level, how conscious you are at any given point in time, or a system is, from totally unconscious to some level of consciousness, on some sort of scale or multiple scales. Then there's conscious content. When you are conscious, you're conscious of something. All the objects, people, and places that might populate your conscious experience right here and right now. And then finally, a key, at least for us, subset of conscious content is self. That part of your ongoing conscious experience, which is the experience of being you. And that is the part of consciousness that most of us cling to most strongly most of the time. Sometimes assume that it's apart from the rest of our conscious experience as an observer of it. But really being a self is just part of our ongoing flow of conscious experiences. So today I don't have time to talk about level, but I'm going to talk about content and self and start with content. And just to kick off this part of the talk with a, with a simple demo, and this is one thing I, I hope works wherever you're viewing this from. This is a, you may well have seen this before. It's called the Lilac Chaser. It's one of my favorite uh, demonstrations of the weirdness of visual perception. If you focus your eyes on the black cross in the middle of the screen, try not to blink or move your eyes. Um, again, I can't really, I can only see the people in the main room, but maybe you guys, if you, if you, if it's working for you, which is to say, if the magenta patches disappear and you just start to see a green patch rotating around, if you can wave at me or something. I'll get some idea that it's that it's, uh, it's doing the job. Oh, good! I see some waving. This is nice. Um, and if you blink and move your eyes, the green patch goes away and the magenta patches return. So why do I show this? Well, um, I show it to make the simple point that what we consciously experience can be a poor guide to what's actually going on there in the world. Um, there is no green disc. There are only magenta patches that turn on and off uh, next to each other. This is a powerful illusion because it's actually a combination of three different things that are, that are going on. There's um, troxler fading, things disappear when they have um, uncertain blurry edges and they're in the periphery. There's apparent motion, uh, there's color opponency, so when we adapt, the brain adapts to see a particular color and it disappears, we brain sort of perceives the opposite in color space. And for me, the, 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 there's actually a fourth thing, which is that I mean, we know that colors don't exist as an objective property of reality. They are constructed by the brain. I mean, Newton has told us that much. Um, but magenta exists even less than other colors. It's what the, uh, the brain constructs when it's expecting to see green but doesn't get it. Uh, so it's quite a nice combination of effects here, but it makes the point that what we consciously see is not a direct reflection of what's there. The real point, of course, is much deeper that we never see what's actually there. Everything we see is always and everywhere a construction uh, of sorts. Now, the idea to understand this illusion and perception in general and conscious contents in general is that your brain is a prediction machine. What you see, hear, and feel are nothing more than your brain's best guesses about the causes of its sensory inputs. Imagine that you are a brain. And you're stuck inside this bony skull trying to figure out what's out there in the world. There's no light in the skull and no sound. All you have to go on as a brain are this stream of electrical signals coming in through the senses, which are only indirectly related to things in the world, whatever they may be. And perception, in this view, has to be a process of informed guesswork in which ambiguous sensory signals are combined with prior expectations or, or Bayesian beliefs about the way the world is to form the brain's best guess of the causes of these signals. So the brain doesn't hear light or, sorry, of course it doesn't hear light. <laughs> the brain doesn't see light or hear sound. What we perceive is the brain's best guess of the causes of these sensory signals. This is a very old idea extending back to von Helmholtz, to 
Kant to Plato even. Uh, but in its modern guise, it's often called uh, some version of predictive coding or predictive processing or active inference. And this is the idea that in the brain, um, the brain is always trying to make this best guess about the causes of sensory signals. Well, what does this mean? It means that the brain is trying to do something like a, uh, an inference, solve an inference problem, it's trying to infer causes from their effects. Uh, this is a process of, of reasoning that's, that's formalized as Bayesian reasoning, going backwards from causes to their most likely effects. And one way that mechanisms can do this it's a difficult, intractable problem to solve completely analytically, but ways that mechanisms can approximate a good solution to this problem of inference is through predictive processing. And what's happening here is that the brain is continually generating top-down, inside-out predictions about the causes of sensory signals. And these predictions are being updated, calibrated, reined in by the real world, uh, by this sensory prediction errors. So the sensory signals just serve as prediction errors, the, the red arrows here, reporting the difference between what the brain expects and what it gets at every level of processing. And the top down arrows, the, the blue arrows, are the brain's predictions that carry predictions about the causes of sensory signals. By minimizing prediction error everywhere and all the time, the brain's predictions settle on a best guess of the causes of these sensory signals. And this approximates the solution to this problem of inference that the brain is faced with when doing perception. So that's a sort of under the hood idea, but it, it, it's worth looking under the hood because it has quite a radical implication for how we understand perception and its relation to the world. It means that perceptual content is conveyed largely by top-down predictions, with bottom-up sensory signals conveying only prediction errors. And this is quite an inversion from how we are used to thinking about things. We're used to thinking that perception is a kind of reading out of the world around us, as if the world pours itself into our minds through the transparent windows of our senses, and we just read out what's there in the sensory signals. This view is quite different that the sensory signals are just bringing our brain's best guesses into some sort of use, uh, useful relationship with the world. And it might not be a relationship that is judged by accuracy. It's judged by utility. We perceive things not as they are, but as they are useful for us as organisms. This is why we experience colors. It's not because they're more accurate. It's because they're useful for the organism to perceive. Okay. So this is just so far ideas, uh, but there is some evidence behind this way of thinking. And there's a bunch of studies. Now I'm just gonna show a couple from, from our own group. This was one uh, quite old study now with Yaya Pinto, who was a postdoc at the time. And here we use the technique called continuous flash suppression in which the one eye is, pre is presented with an image of a house or a face, which gradually increases in contrast. And the other eye is presented with this changing uh, Mondrian type patchwork of, of colored uh, oblongs that diminishes in contrast. And what happens when the, the eyes are seeing these, one eye is seeing each thing is that at some point the image breaks through into consciousness. We become conscious of the house or face. And what we do is we cue people with a word face or house to expect a particular category of image. And so we can ask the question, do people consciously see that which they expect to see more accurately, more quickly than that which they don't expect to see. And you might make the prediction that if conscious content is carried by top-down predictions, then we should consciously see the expected more easily, more quickly, more accurately than the unexpected. And in this experiment, that's in fact uh, what we find, whether it's a detection or a identification a breakthrough time is quicker. It's not a big effect, but it's there. It's quicker for the expected um, category of image. So we see what we expect, not what we don't expect. Colloquially, you can think of, we, it's, it's common to say, I'll, I'll see it when I believe it, but you might equally say the opposite, that I'll believe it when I see it. Sorry, I got that totally the wrong way around. We often say, say, I will believe it when I see it, but we could equally say, 
I'll see it when I believe it. When you do these things too often, they, you do tend to get too easily mixed up in the order of the things to say. Anyway, so that's one piece of evidence. There's a whole load of other stuff uh, that I won't bore you with today. That backs up this, this general idea. But of course, it's, an, it's a really exciting and evolving area. In fact, one thing we're working on in the lab at the moment are cases where one might expect predictions to be carried by bottom-up connections rather than top-down connections. In fact, and we're working here now with hybrid machine learning models in which we have predictions flowing in both directions, uh, but they flow at different timescales and they represent, in our view, different kinds of perceptual experience. So it's, there's, a lot, there's a lot of interesting directions this can go. One direction it can go is, is to ask the question, well, what would happen if our perceptual predictions are too strong and overwhelm the sensory data in some way? And we all are familiar with some everyday examples of this. There are phenomena like pareidolia, where, which is seeing patterns in things. We can see faces in clouds. We can see faces in the arrangement of windows on a church or in a bathtub or wherever. Uh, faces are very salient stimuli for us. So the brain's predictions that faces are the causes of sensory stimuli are fairly strong. Uh, we took this one step further in the lab. This is some, a study you might have seen or, or before. It's uh, something that was based on a Google Deep Dream architecture. We called it a hallucination machine. So what we did was we took one of these classic deep networks that's very good at, at classifying the objects that are present in images. And you can actually run it backwards and you can fix an object category and then update the image until the network settles into a stable state. So what we did was um, uh, we, we took that algorithm, which is the Google Deep Dream algorithm, and we applied it frame by frame to a panoramic video taken at Sussex campus a few years ago. And uh, we replayed this video, or, or rather we, we used this video so it could be watched through a, a head-mounted display, a typical sort of VR or AI headset. And it's, this is what, it, it's hard to really get the experience without the headset, but this is from the footage from somebody wearing it and looking around Sussex campus. And what you can see is it's really quite trippy. It's there are dogs, they're not just photoshopped onto the image, they are organically emerging from the image in all sorts of interesting ways. Now, this is not really like a, well, in my experience, it's not really like an LSD experience, but it bears some, you know, it's evocative of some altered perceptual experiences. And the exciting thing that we're doing with this stuff now is this was the start. So we can sort of change the way we're, we're altering the images to simulate in quite a lot of granularity, different kinds of hallucinatory experience. So right now we're looking at, for instance, at trying to capture the phenomenological differences between psychedelic hallucinations and hallucinations that people develop in dementia and psychosis. Uh, and this is really an exercise in computational phenomenology because we're not so much interested in the different behaviors or decisions people make, but really in modeling what their, how and why their experiences differ. Um, so, and it can all be understood in terms of this balance between prediction and, and prediction error. So in these examples of pareidolia and a hallucination machine, we can think of hallucination as a kind of uncontrolled perception. And then by the same token, that's what, for me, mandates this idea of perception as a kind of controlled hallucination. It doesn't mean that perception is arbitrary. The control is just as important as the hallucination. Perception is tied to the world in useful ways. It also doesn't mean that the mind makes up reality in some way. It's not an idealistic thing. It just means that the way we experience things in the world is always a construction. Things in the world exist. And the more radical claim here is it doesn't just apply to faces and dogs and so on, but to everything, all the contents of our experience, even the structural contents like the passing of time, the visual appearance of objecthood that things have, the sense of reality, the aspect of our phenomenology that things seem real, that is itself part of a prediction, just as change is part of a prediction. Change should be on this slide too. So the, the, this is the challenge. Everything is a kind of prediction. The challenge is to find out what kind of prediction it is that explains that phenomenology. Okay. So in the last part of the talk, and I'll just go on for 10 more minutes, I think maximum, um, is the self. 
So at the beginning, and said we started with the self and, and there is an intuition. Maybe we don't all have this now, but maybe a straw man or a straw self intuition that the self is the thing that does the perceiving that there's a world which provides sensory data or data that is received through our senses. The self receives this data, reads it out to form perceptions of that world. The self is this entity and a unique identity um, perched inside your skull that's doing the perceiving, watching the inner movie. But the self is not like that. The self is part of the movie, part of experience. Both self and world are kinds of controlled hallucinations. But the experience of being a self is a very special and distinctive part of perception. And the challenge is to understand and explain how and why. The first step in this is to recognize that the experience of being a self is not just one thing. It's composed of many different parts. And these parts hang together normally in an experience of self unity for most of us most of the time. But of course, neurology and psychiatry, sometimes meditation, sometimes psychedelic drugs can tell us that these different aspects of self can come apart. Very broadly, we can think about the bodily self, the experience of being and having a body, the perspectival self, the experience of perceiving the world from a particular first person point of view. There's the volitional self, the experience of tending to do things, of being the cause of things that happens. And only then do we get to these higher levels of narrative and social selfhood, where we think about the self as a persistent identity over time, partly defined by social networks and episodic autobiographical memories and plans for the future. All of these aspects of selfhood are bound up in what it is to be a normal adult human self, but they can all come apart. And I want to focus in the time I have left just on the bodily self, the experience of being and having a body. And the idea, again, is that this experience of what it is in the world that is my body is a kind of perceptual prediction. It's not something to be taken for granted. Now, there's a slight sidebar here to one of the most famous experimental demonstrations of this, um, which is the rubber hand illusion. I'm sure you're familiar with the rubber hand illusion, but I'm going to show it because it's fun. In the rubber hand illusion, a person's real hand is hidden from sight on the uh, far side of that part uh, partition, and a rubber hand is placed in front of them, roughly the place where that real hand would normally be. And then the experimenter, the guy in blue, takes two paintbrushes and he strokes both hands in synchrony, in time, while the guy in blue is looking at the fake hand. And after a while, for at least some people, if you do this, they begin to report that the rubber hand, in some sense, begins to feel a little bit like their own hand. And that's the way to test it. You just stab it with a fork and... And it's always fun to do that. So this is kind of a classic, or it's been used as a classic demonstration of how the experience of body ownership can change. And it's usually used to motivate an account in terms of multisensory integration, that the brain is seeing touch on the fake hand, feeling touch because the real hand is being touched there in time. So this, this happy multisensory coincidence leads the brain to make its inference its best guess that the fake hand is in fact part of the body. This is the story anyway, as I told it in the TED talk four years ago. But I just want to update that in, in one minute now. Uh, it's one of the things we've been actually working on much more than I expected, because it turns out to be not so simple. We, led by Peter Lush, we did the world's largest rubber hand study a couple of years ago, just before the pandemic, repeating the rubber hand illusion on about 400 people while also measuring how hypnotically suggestible they are. And now it turns out that the degree to which people experience the rubber hand illusion is very strongly associated with how hypnotically suggestible they are. And if you think about it, that setup of the rubber hand illusion embeds huge demand characteristics. People are encouraged implicitly to experience something. Uh, it's pretty clear, you know, even if they're not consciously aware of what's going on, there's a very strong implicit encouragement to have a particular kind of experience. And so people that are highly hypnotizable do have that experience. Um, if you stroke them out of time, they have it much less, but they would also expect to have it much less. So it still might all be driven by a combination of demand characteristics and suggestibility. 
Uh, so this is something we've gotten into some fights about lately, about we, we don't think there's any evidence for the rubber hand illusion beyond suggestibility. Um, other people think there is. Uh, the basic point still stands, though, that whether it's a combination of top down, whether it's top down suggestibility or bottom up multisensory integration, the experience of body ownership is still changing. And it's still a perceptual inference of some sort. Now, in the last bit, I want to go from the body as an object in the world to this experience of being a body, of just being a living organism. This starts with things like emotions and moods, but for me, bottoms out in a very, very deep lying, simple experience of just being alive, being a living organism. Um, this kind of experience highlights a form of perception called interoception. Now, the, the body, the interior of the body is, in a sense, like the, like the rest of the world. The brain, it, there's no direct access to what's going on in the body. It has to infer the state of the body from noisy and ambiguous sensory data. Uh, it has to do interoceptive perceptual inference. And the same, this is at least a proposal. There's very little data for this, but the proposal from a paper of mine almost 10 years ago now is that the same process of predictive processing applies, the exchange of prediction and prediction error. This is a process of interoceptive inference. But there's a key difference here, which is that interoceptive predictions are about controlling things rather than finding things out. The primary purpose of having a brain is to keep the body alive. So predictions about the causes of interoceptive variables, things like heart rates, blood pressure, blood sugar levels. They don't care where the internal organisms are or what color the blood is and so on. These predictions care about how well the brain is doing at regulating these variables. So they stay within the narrow ranges that are compatible with us continuing to stay alive. Interoceptive predictions are about control rather than finding things out. One thing I need to mention to make sense of that idea is that there are two ways to minimize prediction error. You can minimize prediction error by updating predictions. That's what I've been talking about so far. But you can also minimize prediction error by making actions so that the sensory data change to fulfill already existing predictions. In this case, predictions serve as sort of targets or set points for regulation. And this, I think, is what the, the way to understand perceptual inference as applied to interoception. It's about regulation. And this difference, I think, helps us understand why visual experiences, let's say, are different from emotional experiences. Visual experiences under visual predictions underpin visual perceptual experience. These the brain is making now predictions about where things are in space, how things might change as we move around them. So that's what we experience, objects with properties and spaces between them. But interoceptive predictions underpin embodied experience of how things are going. How is it going for the, uh, for the agent? And that's what we experience in terms of interoceptive perceptual content. Basically, emotions, moods, how well things are going. Are things going well or badly for us? Likely to go good or bad in the future? So there's a nice mapping between type of prediction and type of experience here. Now, there's many deep links one can make here. One of them is to cybernetics back in the 1950s, 40s, up to the 70s. Ross Ashby here, the British pioneer of cybernetics, made the point that every good regulator of a system must be a model of that system. To effectively regulate something like physiology of the body, you have to have a predictive model of how the internal physiology of the body will, will respond to potential challenges. And then ultimately, I think, we can go back to where this talk started and this idea of self-change blindness. A consequence of predictions being geared towards regulation and control is that the brain might have priors, expectations that the body will remain stable because that becomes a self-fulfilling prediction that actually instantiates the regulation, not just passively reflecting how well regulation is going. So we might experience ourselves as more continuous than we actually are, because that is part and parcel of the whole process by which predictive models attain stability. So we can be subjectively blind to the changing self, both because the self is relatively stable, but also because it makes sense to perceive ourselves as stable, even though we do change to ensure this 
aspect of regulation, both at low physiological levels, but also at higher levels of psychological identity. Okay, now I'm almost done. And I wanna just draw a few broader messages from all this. The first is that in this view, consciousness, our conscious experiences are closely intimately tied to our nature as living creatures because these predictive mechanisms that undergird all our conscious experiences have their origin and their debt moment to moment operation, always in light of the fundamental imperative to stay alive. That's, that's, why, that's what these predictive models are for. And the predictions that are made by these models are always have an inflection, reflect, inflection about what, how they're relevant to our, our prospects of staying alive. That was a very clumsy way of returning to the first thing I said, which is that we perceive the world around us and the self within it with, through, and because of our living bodies. Now I have to have the customary pop at Descartes at this point, because Descartes said at one point that living, our nature's living system is probably had nothing to do with conscious experiences as he thought of them as tied to rationality and so on. He called other animals beast machines. Without minds to direct their bodily movements, animals must be regarded as unthinking, unfeeling machines that move like clockwork. And I'm rather saying the opposite, that conscious selfhood arises because of and not in spite of our beast machine nature. So I'll wrap up in two minutes with some implications. And I won't go into this in detail at all. We can discuss those. The first is that. Everything about selfhood, I think, can be understood this way. Even quite recalcitrant aspects of self, like free will, can be usefully understood as a perceptual inference that has a particular kind of function. In this case, the function of perceiving the consequences of internally generated voluntary actions. Another implication is, of course, that we all have different brains, so we all will inhabit our own distinctive perceptual worlds, our own personalized inner universes. And I think we may overestimate the degree to which our inner universes are similar, because this is the price of communication. Our individual inner universe, our human experience more broadly, is just one way of being consciousness. And I think I always just love the idea, and much has been written about octopuses lately, I write about them too, considering the inner life of an octopus just brings about how different inner universes could be in terms of the different kinds of perceptual predictions that might be at play. And finally, there's a thought about the future of AI and the possibility of conscious machines. In the story that I've been telling, consciousness has more to do with being alive than being intelligent, that it's deeply grounded in our nature as living machines. Um, this casts some doubt on the idea that Artificial consciousness is simply a matter of artificial intelligence uh, that you program it the right way and, and suddenly the lights, the inner lights come on. And um, lots we could discuss about this, but one thing to bring up is that wetware is not the same thing as hardware. The imperative for regulation and control in living systems goes all the way down. It's very hard to know at what point the mind stops and the, and the body starts. And so to say that consciousness is somehow substrate independent is a is a quite a difficult claim to to make from this perspective okay so i'm going to stop there uh, with this key claim that we perceive the world around us and ourselves within it with through and because of our living bodies and yeah this is the book it's actually out tomorrow in the us and canada so i hope um i've not put you off from maybe buying it if you've been planning to and um if you do, I'd love to know what you make of it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Is it muted? I can, can hear you. you. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, yeah. So what I thought we'd do is um, for those of you in the audience who are remote, could you put your questions in the chat? And I'm going to try to unmute you when your question comes up. And then the audience, you get to raise your hands. And we're going to start with um, a member of the audience who I think is also in London, David Wood. 
Thanks, uh, Anil. That's a super talk. Uh, I have to hurry up and finish reading Steven Pinker and Andrew Yang, so I've got room for your book as well. You started off by being quite modest. You said it wasn't clear to you whether what you were proposing would actually dissolve the hard problem. So how much time do you think it might take before we can say for one one way or the other, whether this approach has been sufficient. Should it become clear in a year or two, or will we still be discussing this in three decades' time? Well, this is a really, it's, you know, of course, predictions are difficult when they're about the future. Um, it, it's, it's, there's such a psychological desire to think that we'll get to the other side of this big problem within my lifetime, our, our general lifetime, and so on. I, I, st I, I think humility is the right thing. Um, because I think what it will take is, is us looking at the problem in a different way, that, that the outcome of this trajectory is not going to be that we will suddenly see, um, you know, oh, this is the solution. It's just that we'll understand consciousness to be continuous with nature in a way that hasn't been apparent so far. When will this happen? Here, I can only to think about what has happened and it's often tempting for people to say like oh we understand nothing about the brain basis of consciousness it's still a complete mystery and i always get frustrated when people say this because a lot has been discovered i think looking back at the last 20 years an awful lot is known now about consciousness than was then and that's completely compatible with the continuing disagreement about the existence of this big mystery We've gone from collecting data about empirical correlations to now having a number of competing theories and we're figuring out how do we disambiguate between these theories. Uh, I really think there has been progress. Optimistically, I think another 20 years, if we make the same amount of progress again, I, I don't think it will be like this eureka moment where it's suddenly like, okay, it's fine, done. Um, but... I do think our perspective on consciousness will have changed substantively in another 20 years. Be beyond that, it's almost impossible to say. I have no idea what tools will be available, what concepts people will have, and so on. Thanks. OK, um, let me take a question from the room. Elon. So I'm, I'm first of all, I'm curious why you feel the need to decouple interoception and exoception when they're going to be highly coupled. There's, it's clear that whatever regulatory kind of predictive model you want to have on the interoception side is to some extent uh, going to be in service of, or it's going to, uh, exoception is going to be in service of that. So to what extent can you really, uh, I don't know, uh, ultimately separate those functionally speaking? That's, that's okay. This that's a good question. I mean, I don't, I, I think if I gave the impression I wanted to completely separate them, then I, I didn't mean to give that impression. I, I, I actually agree with you. In fact, I think that's, that's part of that slogan at the beginning that we perceive the world around us you know, with, through, and because of our living bodies. I think, as you nicely put it, extraception is ultimately in the service of interoceptive regulation, and there's going to be integration at, at, at all levels. I only mean that it's it's conceptually useful to think of these roles slightly differently, um, almost maybe over, over uh, phylogeny as well. Seems to me interoception probably came first before extraception. This may also be true developmentally, though, though I'm not sufficiently knowledgeable to know. But yes, that, that they're not only going to interact, but also this, this distinction between perception is figuring out what's there versus control oriented. You might call it epistemic versus instrumental perception. That also cross cuts both domains. So the classic yeah, example here of things. Oh, okay. It seemed, it seemed at first like, like I, I was intrigued by the distinction. This is a regulatory one and this is something yeah. else, uh, just yeah. or so to speak, but uh, ultimately. Yeah, no, I mean, th this is something I, I, I do expand on. I would like to, if I have more time, use examples like there's things like perceptual control theory and of course, ecological perception. You know, you catch a cricket ball, somebody throw it or a baseball, or whatever in the state, you throw a ball, you catch it. Arguably what you're perceiving is, is catchability. Your, your, your brain is working to regulate a extraceptive perceptual variable now, the, the tangent of the angle of the ball to the horizon. So it's engaging. So, so th these two things can indeed uh, cross cut, but there seems to be a more a sort of primary imperative for um, interception is, is regulation of the physiology, and 
extraception has all manifested in many, many different ways. But all of those, they, they do interact. And it's experimentally, it's very challenging because, because they interact, but also because interoceptive variables are just so difficult to access. I mean, we've been trying at Sussex to even figure out ways of measuring things like interoceptive sensitivity. And it's just really, really hard. Uh, you can't to do an interceptive psychophysics is so much more challenging than to do vision, which is why many of us end up doing vision because it's easy. Right. Thanks. So uh, and the second question, I guess, is um, so these 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 objects, so to speak, in your in your causal model, I guess, those are the objects of consciousness itself, right? And, and, and that's that's how you're ultimately is that how you're trying to account? I still don't get what you know how this gives you subjectivity. Uh, is it, you, you seem to be giving a, a, in some ways a, a functional account um, that it would be these purposeful meaning, you know, what we would consider self is sort of, in, in, it has a, a functional role in, in terms of predictive modeling. But how does that give you the redness of red? I, I, I don't, I fail to see how it solves. Do you, do, are you solving the hard problem? I know the word no. is kind yeah, of- I'm dissolving it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, th this this whole like failing to see how is is. I mean, it's I I, it's in it. It's true. It it comes up for a good reason because it's still with this like you you know what what is it about the account I've given that magic's qualia from mechanism? There isn't anything in the account I've given. But what I'm trying to do is is, is shift focus onto phenom phenomenological properties. Is so, something like, or is distracting? Right, <laughs> this is the question. Yeah, I mean, it's you might it, it could be it, you can think of it as as distracting. That's that's fine. If if there's if you have a alternative of how to get at the hard problem more head on without just sort of making some untestable claim about it, that's absolutely fine. My strategy is 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 to remain back to the the previous question, remain a little bit modest and with certain humility about the extent to which this is going to solve or dissolve uh, the hard problem. But I think we've got here an experimental and pragmatic trajectory that, that I can begin to characterize. You know, th th this whole aspect of phenomenology is so overlooked, I think, in, in discussions of the neuroscience of consciousness. I mean, it's not completely overlooked. People like Mind and Life have been banging on about it for ages. But if, if I can understand, for, for instance, for me, the key insight was like, ah, I can understand like something about the, the, the experiential character of emotion can be understood falls out of, of, under, of this framework in a way that connects it to visual experience but but un, but explains the differences between them and for me that's that's a, a good a good a good start and from there i sort of rec, like think okay what for me the, okay, okay so let me put it completely on the table here the reason i have a bit of optimism about it is because i'm i'm just intrigued by this uh, this connection about life and, and consciousness that was not a starting point, but was sort of the end point of this, this reasoning through this whole predictive perception model of the brain. And you know, there, there's, there's somewhere in the back of my mind this idea that, that it's life that breathes fire into the equations that might provide the final dissolution of what we think of as, as the, the hard problems we currently see it. Now, we're not there yet, and I've, I've in no way demonstrated that. But I can, I can see that as the point back to the first question that I would like to reach in 20 or 30 years. Maybe it's wrong, but I think it's a way to go. And I think it, for me, it's much more satisfying than trying to create some arbitrary construction, whether it's integrated information or microtubules that crosses the explanatory gap, but actually does very little explanatory work and is not testable. Thank you so much. And uh, I'd love to talk more about digital life in that case. Because... I'll do a follow up. Um, <laughs> organizers privilege. Yeah. So, all right. So I love that you brought up, you know, the issue of breathing fire into the equations and, um, you know, it raises the issue of how to define life, though, which I think was in the back of my mind when I was reading your book. So, um, just from my time at NASA, I mean, I could see that, you know, in the astrobiology community, there's a humongous disagreement about how to define life. And it's not actually a closed issue at all, even though you're right that Elon Vital has been ruled out, <laughs> luckily, right? Um, right. But, you know, we still haven't ruled out all sorts of different theories about the nature of life. And there's a massive epistemological problem in the theory of life community about 
how we can even look for life that's not like life on earth. Um, anyway, the upshot of that is that if, if you look at say NASA's definition of life, right? Like posted at the NASA Astrobiological Institute website, it's the definition that a lot of astrobiology researchers are deferring to. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it just is like a self-sustaining chemical process capable of Darwinian evolution. And A-lifers will tell you that, you know, they can create artificial systems that satisfy that. And mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm totally sympathetic with the book's claims about biological systems having something special that we can kind of get a better picture about consciousness from. Mm -hmm. But then I don't think deferring to the theory of life work helps you with that. It's almost as if the additional step is that you need to take a stand on what life is, I'm afraid. Mm. <laughs> yeah, this is a this is an excellent point. <laughs> of course, mess, thank you. Textbook. But but I mean, I, I I'm I'm totally on your team. In fact, I, I I would have said, hey, just why don't you just step up to the plate and call yourself a biological naturalist? Well, that I was I was going to say <laughs> yes, exactly. I mean, here's you, you've again picked on my my tendency to just sort of shy away from 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 the more dramatic claims, which I don't I I still do that. So I think it is worth just laying out those distinctions. So biological naturalism, I guess, for everybody else. Is as I understand it, is this position um, that consciousness is an exclusive property of living systems, like only living systems can be conscious. Um, there's also a related position of biopsychism, which is that all living things are conscious somehow. And I'm certainly not asserting a biopsychist position, and I'm agnostic about a biological naturalist position. What I am willing to step up to the plate and saying is we cannot understand, maybe it's an epistemological biological naturalist or something. I, I think we can only understand human consciousness in light of understanding our nature as living machines. Now, this, this is not as strong a statement as biological naturalism. That's true. Why not? Well, because I don't understand enough myself yet about this how and why life might fulfill the role that, that I'm hoping uh, that it will. Um, and you're also right that it brings up tricky issues about defining life. And yeah, the one on, on NASA, that's, that's interesting. I, you know, I tend to get drawn to the more sort of autopoesis ideas of, of life, um, which, which emphasize for me this, this regulation process that goes all the way down and, and self-generates the components that constitutes the self-regulating system and it's it's therefore not something and you can simulate these things for sure so you know you can artificial life is i mean i used to do artificial life yeah you can simulate whatever but the fact you can simulate something is not the same as instantiating that thing so i'm, I'm very unmoved by the the ability of people to simulate things as to rendering a view a perspective on claims about sufficiency Thank you. Um, Emanuela, in the uh, chat, I said I unmuted you. You ready for Thank you question? for a beautiful lecture, dear Anil. Yeah, hello. Uh, I, have a, I have a question about uh, time. Uh, as you know, very many uh, physicists play with the idea that now is an illusion. In the part where you presented prediction, the work with Carl Friston, you uh, very uh, sharply, and I think experimentally narrowed uh, consciousness and the self to a period of now and a little time horizon, which is the horizon of prediction and an action. I was playing as you talked with the idea of having two definitions of the conscious self. One would be this uh, period of now and mm. multiple self that you described as passing phase transitions by a uh, relation, proximal relations between instant in time, which resemble Shannon's information theory and discrete uh, time steps, which are related in a proximal manner. I was also thinking about coordination dynamics and a continuous relation uh, in time. And I was uh, trying to ask uh, if you could conce conceptualize uh, the self 
as the total sum experience from when you are born to now or when you are dead, mm -hmm. and the self being this entire uh, spatial temporal construct where the embedding of the time dimension is completely uh, explained in uh, the total sum experience, not narrowing it to an instant of now, but uh, enlarging it to the whole phenomenological mm -hmm. experience of a life, life uh, of a life. Okay. Thank you. I mean, there's a lot, lot to unpack there. Um, I'll try and keep a, a relatively brief answer. Um, there is something, and this, for me, it goes back to points actually made by, I first remember reading about by Nick Humphrey about consciousness, the conscious scene in the, marks out the present, distinguishes it from the past and the, the remembered past and the imagined future. But of course, it's not an instantaneous present. And there's been you know, huge work in phenomenology, thinking about well, what, what is the present moment in our experience? It always projects a little bit into the future and it always extends a little bit into the past. There's this notions of protension and retention that are key to the phenomenology of the passing of time. Um, and that applies to the sort of the experience as it unfolds in the experienced now. Um, but then there are also wider horizons of time, as, as, you, as you point out. And we, certainly we as humans, we, we have our experience. So I think our ex extraceptive experience is more constrained by this slightly extended present. But our self-related experience does um, instantiate over many different timescales. I mean, we what it is to be me is partly defined by my episodic memories that don't extend right back to my birth, although that, you know, they, those, whatever happened then shaped who I am. But this explicit experience of self, it is shaped by memories and imagined uh, futures. So I completely with you that as the self gets more abstract, it also generalizes further over, over time horizons too and you know we can see this in human development as well as you know, time is is relatively narrow for infants and, and broadens out uh, during development uh, you just mentioned a couple other things like yeah the, the view i'm putting is is close to sort of stuff with mark soames and cal friston but there are also differences especially with with um mark soames and then the sorts of mathematics one might use to model these things i think that's a very much open question you, you, you know you referenced shannon and versus coordination dynamics scott kelso and so on um yeah, I think I just park that and say these kinds of different mathematical tools can be both good intuition pumps and perhaps useful concrete uh, models also. Thank you. Okay, so the next person, the next uh, question is from Lenore Blum. Oh, hi. Okay. Hi, Anil, and hi, Susan, and I'm looking forward to getting your book tomorrow, oh, which I great, ordered great. for myself and my student here. Okay, so um, can you not imagine a machine that needs and wants to take care of its own body? And uh, I think despite your many, many protests, you may actually be helping map out a roadmap to construct such a machine. And I know you protest this all the time and you, you almost go to the limit, but there may, you, you may be going, I mean, you may actually be mapping such a, a map out. Um, okay? Yep, yeah, you fine, yes. responsibility for that. Well, yeah, I mean, so, so just, just for the rest of the audience, this, this is sort of, um, there is, of course, uh, and Susan will notice as well, I mean, there's, there's portions of various communities across neuroscience, AI, and whatever, computer science, that have the objective, like, let's try to build a conscious machine. Let's just try to build something that has experiences. And um, as Lenore knows, I tend to say, let's, let's, let's not do that. Let's not try to build conscious machines. Um, a, we don't know how, but B, we also don't, so we don't know what it would take, but we also don't know what it wouldn't take. Um, because there's just uncertainty about whether consciousness is substrate independent, so on and so on. Um, and there's a lot of ethical pitfalls in certainly in success, whether it's planned or inadvertent, but also in attempts where we might build things that give the appearance of being conscious, 
but aren't, which might distort our moral and ethical circles in socially problematic ways. So that's the, the sort of the thing that I say that I keep saying, and you're right that I do, but am I undermining that by, as you say, providing uh, a roadmap for in fact doing it? And here, I guess I have to hold my hand up and say, in, indeed, in trying to, trying to understand consciousness, one is always opening the door to, to synthesis and to construction. Um, now, quite what that might entail, whether building so whether building a conscious machine involves first building a living system, I mean, that's which would be the sort of biological naturalist position, um, mm. is, yeah, is to my mind still a little unclear. In the book, I sort of go through this thought experiment of building a silicon beast machine, a machine that indeed has wants, desires, needs, engages in self-regulation, uh, and so on. And you know, ask the question, is this silicon beast machine going to be conscious? And here's where we get back to this, this thing about what breathes fire into the equations. And unless the imperative for self-regulation goes all the way down in a sort of autopoetic sense, my intuition is that it doesn't and that you'd still just have a simulation, an embodied simulation of a conscious system rather than an actually conscious system. Um, but that is not a, a guarantee. So. Yeah, I think I think this, but this is frankly why. So I'm I'm not arguing against the attempt to understand consciousness. I'm more just trying to argue against this, like, oh shit, let's do it because it's cool uh, attitude, which is just not a good way to to go about developing potentially ethically catastrophic technologies. We have to understand because it's centrally important to our, our human survival nature to understand consciousness you know we're not going to stop understanding but we should do it in an informed way and recognize the ethical and moral consequences of that understanding i totally agree with you but and i don't get me wrong actually i'm interested in constructing a conscious machine actually i'm not against that and i think that raises lots of questions that we have to think about but to protest that it's not possible when you're actually uh, doing all the research that may lead up to that I find a little bit ingenuous. <laughs> okay, but um, I said okay. we'd think about um, privately. Yeah, well, I'm sure I'm we will. And uh, this with you. Yes. Yeah, no, there's lots to lots to discuss there for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, but thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, Neil Leach is next. Mm -hmm. Neil, I just asked yeah. you to unmute. I, I am unmuted. Yeah, I think I think I am. Uh, thanks, Daniel. Um, Fantastic lecture as always, and I have got a copy of your book arriving tomorrow. I hope. Um, just I, I, as you know, I'm interested very much in, in trying to rethink the, the question of creativity beyond the Maggie Bonin uh, para, uh, uh, paradigm. And um, one of the kind of interesting kind of questions is, is to what extent creativity involves consciousness. Um, uh, Melanie Mitchell has a comment in her book that uh, you have to be conscious to be creative, which to some extent I, I believe. Um, in a sense, you have to be able to appreciate um, that you've been creative. And I, from that point of view, I don't think that AlphaGo can be conceived as being creative. Now, at the same time, there's a guy called Max Tegmark, you probably know his work, um, who says, well, but hold on a second, we're not fully conscious of everything we do, you know. And, you know, I'm uh, aware of the fact that, you know, let's say the light bulb moment when something occurs to us. You know, sure, but we're not necessarily, we, we're conscious of what occurs to us and we can appreciate it. But it seems to me there's something that is erupting that maybe we're not fully conscious of. And so I'm very interested in, in when you, the comment you made about breaking through into consciousness. You know, mm -hmm. It's to my mind as though there is some kind of filter there that is protecting us from the, um, the otherwise overstimulation of all the things that are going on inside our body. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wonder if you could sort of uh, say something about it. And, and, and what is it? Is it? Can we describe this maybe in computational terms as being some kind of compression or a filter? What is that kind of barrier or that filter that is kind of in some ways uh, keeping certain information away from us that, that, that otherwise in the creative process, let's say? Yeah. Well, I think, so you make a uh, um, couple of really good points there, Neil. I mean, the, the first thing is I think this is not just true of creativity, it's true of perception in general, right? We what we perceive is both less than and more than what's actually going on in the world. 
color again being a good example we perceive a universe of colors from three wavelengths but we're insensitive to the vast majority of the electromagnetic spectrum um you know there's a function of consciousness i think in providing this unified multimodal scene in a way that guides our behavior in a way that is relevant for our future survival our physiological regulation um, so not everything that happens in sensation in in the world or in our brains or in our bodies is immediately relevant for that for that aim and that you know that provides some indication of this as you say filter although i don't like filter because it always suggests that it's just a narrowing down of what's possible but it's always creative too so it's not only less than it's also more than um now to creativity i i as you know i'm not an expert here but i rather think you hit the nail on the head that where consciousness comes into the creativity process is not so much at the generative stage but at the recognition stage um that the hard problem is not, you know, what, what, I can't remember Maggie's criteria now, things like no, something has to be novel, but then there's sort of historical novelty, personal novelty, and so on, combinatorial in some interesting way, things that you can imagine computers doing, and of course, computers have, have been used to generate, in quotes, creative uh, works of art or creative uh, products of some sort. But the question is, who judges them as being successfully creative, and, and that tends to be a conscious observer. And I'm not aware of any psychological experiment where people can um, make judgments about creativity uh, based on unconscious perceptions in the same way they might be able to do blind sight about the detection of visual stimuli. So it may be that it's the recognition and decision about what counts as creative uh, that requires the kind of integration of information across timescales, across things that, that um, go along with consciousness in the human case. Great. So um, our in-person crowd, need we need to end because we have a reception. Oh. Yeah. And I wish you were here. I oh, mean, yeah, we damn it. That, that's disappointing. I know. I it would have been fun. Um, <laughs> and so I'll, I'll see you in yeah. November. And we, I should announce that event. Um, I mean, I won't see you in person, but um, the event I'm referring to is at the Science Museum with on your book, where I think I'm commenting and Roger Penrose and um, Helen Stewart is- I think so. Like, what? <laughs> I'm just finding the link. I'll pop it in the chat. Um, I'll, I'll send it somewhere. to the group. Um, it sounds really fun. And, and of course I'm gonna be writing something up about life now that we spoke because there's a puzzle there. There is, there is. Yeah, there I really, is. yeah. We should. I'm looking forward to discussing that more. And I think you're yeah. the yeah, ideal yeah, person I'll to discuss that with. Um, this is the link, by the way. Yeah, oh, so fabulous. it will be. It will be in person for. I don't know where the Ian, what the Ian visits website is, but anyway, that's what came up on Google. Um, it will be in person in the Science Museum uh, for those who are in London. Um, but it will also be like this event. It will be hybrid too, and Susan will be a. Uh, zooming in and we'll we'll make sure to have a reception after that too to which you won't be able to come susan i hope that's okay <laughs> oh man <laughs> this is depressing okay <laughs> well thank you for speaking to our group we really appreciate it and <laughs> i hope all the listeners do get a chance to read your book and congratulations um and um happy release day tomorrow Thank you very much. Thanks, Susan. This is really nice to see you and uh, very grateful for the invitation to talk about it. And yeah, thanks for everything and see you soon. And goodbye, everybody else. See you soon. Bye. Bye-bye.